So, Bob, whenever you come over to my house, my dog mauls you, and then we proceed, because you love dogs, and sure. dogs love you, hmm. and then we proceed to, you know, talk to the dog, give the dog attention. I somehow figure out a way to separate the dog from you so you can sit down in front of a microphone and we can talk to the listeners, because the listeners love you as well. Oh, wow. The listeners are, you know, essentially emotionally just like my dog. When you come on the podcast, they jump up in your face, maybe sniff the crotch, mm -hmm. maybe not. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. let's uh, read some uh, patron emails and respond to them. What do you say? That sounds good. This is the Psychology and Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. And I'm your friend, Bob. I'm a therapist in practice here in Seattle as well. And this first email is from an anonymous patron. She says, do you know of any empirical research or have any thoughts on choosing the gender of a therapist? Oh. What prompted this question, though, is that I have a female friend who has a very negative dynamic with her mother. She recently told me she would never see a female therapist. Meanwhile, I have a hard time imagining seeing a male therapist myself. Likewise, I know a few men who have said they could never see a female therapist or could never see a male therapist and usually cite their relationships with their mother or other women as to why. They all back it up with similar logic, but with seemingly no pattern in the conclusion, whether it's male or female. I guess it's because while I have trouble with closeness in my relationship, my healthiest relationships are with my female friends or other female family members. While I have had healthy relationships with men, my experience has been that their capacity for strong displays of emotion, rumination, etc., is minimal. So I guess I just assume that even though a therapist is male, that very important aspect could be lacking. Also, I'm a straight female, and it makes sense to me to eliminate any possibility of romantic feelings in such a personal relationship. Curious about your thoughts. Bob, what do you think? I don't know of any empirical data on uh, gender choice. I never heard anybody research. I never heard anything about it. Yeah. You? Yeah. I, back in the day, it's hard to uh, measure, right? Because what question do you ask? Do you ask, right. you know, what gender do you prefer? Right. I'm sure there are averages that you could find. Do you ask, um, yeah, are you satisfied with your decision or are the outcomes better? Um, oh, like right. one of the things you could do is you could say, what's your preference? And then just randomly assign people and then test to see if their preference, if it was frustrated, led to worse outcomes. Right. Um, but, you know, the outcomes in therapy is such a hard thing. It's a hard thing. To measure anyway. It is. Because by, you know, anyway. So, yeah. So I remember the I remember the research vaguely, and it has been researched. But <clears throat> I remember the conclusion was that it's just hard to say, and mm -hmm. it's highly personal, and it depends. Yeah, because you know, to me, it's like the distinction. Of, there are many things one can say about a particular therapist, male, female, or you know, other genders, is just one of the identities. Yeah, you have. Gay, straight, bi, trans, right. uh, asexual, you know, you have all those identities. You know, people don't usually say, I want a heterosexual therapist. Mm -hmm. But sometimes people say, I want a gay therapist. Yeah. Uh, but how many people concern themselves with that identity, you know, right. on average, compared to the gender thing? Uh, tall, short, yeah. old, young. Parent, not parent. Atheist, uh, you oh, know, non-atheist. That one comes up. Not frequently, but I'd say more frequently than some of the others. Yeah. But to me, I don't know about you, uh -huh. knowing all the different therapists that I know yeah. and all the different identities thereof, yeah. uh, I almost never use the word thereof verbally. Um, <laughs> but you, you're expanding your horizons. <laughs> uh, ergo, um, <laughs> the, the, the details of what will make someone a good, you know, when someone asks me for a referral, like a friend or someone that, you know, and they're like, I'm kind of looking for a therapist like this and I can, because I know them, I can kind of gauge among the dozen yeah. or so people that I typically refer yeah. who will be a good match. Gender almost has nothing to do with it. Yeah. it. It's the vibe. It's the way this therapist is as a human being, their personality, mm -hmm. their belief system about what 
makes people change and how fast they go through there and the, the warmth I, I maybe that's part of it maybe if i put it into words it's when I think about therapists in terms of their most distinctive quality yeah. uh, about how to match them up, it's it's the amount of warmth they have. Mm -hmm. And also just the way they tend to click in terms of their logic. Um, I, I find that to be so much more um, informative in terms of who I think would be a good match. What do you think about that? Yeah, uh, well, um, I'd say that if gender is going to be a distraction, it probably makes sense to you know, choose the gender that's the least distracting to you. And at the same time, I don't like it when we make these, you know, rules about such things because we eliminate the possibility of something else. So what? most of my, I've been, I've had probably somewhere between 10 and 15 therapists throughout the course of my life. And um, the vast majority of them have been women, but I think that's more like, there's just more women therapists. At least there were where, where I was. Um, and right did you now, ask for a female therapist during those times? I don't recall asking uh, about gender one way or the other. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I do. So my current therapist right now is a man. And I actually feel like his being a man is really useful for me, though. I don't know that I would have chosen a man mm, on purpose. I wouldn't have chosen a man on purpose. So I like that he's a guy. And. I, there's things about talking to him that are different from talking to a woman, but I don't think it's better than talking to a woman. And I don't think talking to women is better than talking to a man. It's just different. Um, what, how we focus some of the way in which we focus, but in terms of the transference, it's the same mm. meaning, meaning that the same feelings that come up for me with my female therapists come up for me with, my um my guy yeah yeah the transference of um a need for closeness yes a need for um a reassurance that they're not thinking bad thoughts about you yeah. that they like you yeah. and that they're going to stick around yeah um yeah now uh i will say so basically our thing is gender is a thing. It's not like it's not a thing. Yeah. But it doesn't it 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 is it it's a bit strange to me anyway that people really focus on it as as much as they do. That they overweigh it as a Yeah, it's one of the first questions I ask people when I don't really know them very well and yeah. they're asking for a therapist right. because they often do have a preference. Right. Like I'll give them names and they'll be like, oh, I, actually, I'm looking for a female therapist or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so I've learned over time that it's good to know. Just ask. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think part of it is that uh, there are, uh, I, I think, misconceptions about gender that I think will mislead people. Like, yeah. for example... Uh, this this letter this, this anonymous patron said <laughs> that men have a minimal capacity for strong dis displays of emotions. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, socialization is a thing, but among therapists, it's not anecdotally true in my experience yeah. at all. Uh, most of my trainees are female, identify as cisgender female, and they all have problems with expressing emotions. Oh, sure. They all have problems with even knowing their emotions. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. You know, this, there's this misconception of just like, if you don't really have the experience delving into various, you know, literally hundreds, if not thousands of people on this topic of emotional awareness right. and uh, non-shame and freedom of expression, right. um, everyone is you know, massively stunted, particularly in Western society. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to some extent, men, I've found if there is a generalization, they have an easier time opening up through the discovery process of graduate school and therapy because they are one, I think, so bottled up mm -hmm. comparatively. And two, because there's this kind of reverse sexism that happens where when men will express themselves there's a lot of appreciation about it because oh, it, right. it goes against the grain right and so i think a lot of men get a fair amount of reinforcement yeah. on that level whereas women 
might not get that as much reinforcement right. because there's still, still. particularly I think in and actually I've never really thought about this but uh, I think it stands to reason if it's just uh, uh, anyway the for women they are you know because of sexism treated like they are automatically not competent do you know what I mean yes and so they have to act twice as competent right. to be treated as you know with the same respect as as a man does and so in the therapy world which is a highly professionalized um you know profession these days yeah right women will put a lot of effort into trying to come across like professionals uh-huh. uh, whereas men are just kind of assumed like oh yeah you're you know right. there'll be a, a group of psychology trainees and you know typically it's like uh, one male for every 10 females. Mm-hmm. The one male, when he talks, even though he's just as ignorant as everyone else, it just seems to hold more weight given, mm-hmm. given sexism. You That's know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And when a woman talks, it's, it's just not taken as seriously. Yeah. And so the, uh, so I, and because we mistake professionalism with stoicism and non-emotionality, right. um, I think that, um, is a is another barrier that women have to overcome in this weird kind of backward way, you it's, know. It is a weird, right? Yeah, and so I, and since most of my students are women, I have a, and most of my trainees, most of my supervisees, yeah, I I have a lot of experience with this, with breaking my uh, stereotype that women are better with emotions because I have not experienced that at all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, everyone sucks with emotions, <laughs> women included. Um, now, might women be more socialized to uh, just like the average woman on the street mm-hmm. be more likely to uh, accept emotions in themselves and other people? Maybe, you know, again, because of socialization. Yeah. But the level of emotionality that you need to exhibit and be aware of to become like a really competent therapist is so so way beyond even like an above average female in our society it's so way beyond that you know and so so you know anonymous patron one of the things that kind of irks me a little bit when people even have a preference for gender when it comes to their therapist is because i think it's often based on these misconceptions yes you, anonymous patron, have this idea that men have a minimal, just all men have a minimal capacity for strong displays of emotions. Um, that is, that's just not my experience. Of, you know, it's not your experience of a men? Ther- a therapist. Of therapists. Well, but even of, you know, maybe it's just the men I hang around with or something, mm-hmm. but uh, I, I just, I, I find that in a cultural pocket where the men have problems with emotions, I'm guessing the women do too, do you yeah. know? So again, on average, for sure, men are socialized to deny emotions more, for yeah. sure, so yeah. that we've, we, can, we can measure that empirically. Right. But, um, but anyway, so you know, if you were to get a referral for a male therapist, my guess is, is that on average, they're, they're gonna be pretty good because they've yeah. been trained. Yeah. Um, or at least not any more likely right. to be bad than a woman would be. Right. Um, Worth kicking the tires on. You know, like if you do get a male therapist referral, why not check it out just yeah. to see? Yeah. Um, having said all that, I will say it's perfectly fine to have a preference. Yeah, there's, sure. there's nothing wrong with yeah. being like, I want this, I want that, I want that. I tell you, the preference that bugs the crap out of me the most is the geographic preference. Mm. Like people's like, well, I don't want to travel that far. You know, and I get it on the one hand, it's Seattle and traffic sucks here and it's far and people have lots of obligations on the one hand, I get that. But um, sometimes the best person isn't geographically geographically convenient and ruling out because they're not, I think is, a, I always, I say to people, look, minimize the importance of geography when you're looking for a counselor because a good one's harder to find than a local one. Yeah, that's true. A, uh, once you find a good therapist, yeah. um, it's such a, it's such a find, right? Yeah. Once you connect with someone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that it, to deny that possibility because of a, 30 minute commute as opposed to a 15 minute commute. Yeah. Right. You know, it just yeah. seems like not, um, 
the right priorities. Yeah. Um, the the assumption I'm guessing that you're that you're hearing and they're when they're saying that is like, oh, you're assuming that you're going to find a good match within a short distance of your home right. or your work. Yeah. Uh, I, I would think again on that. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because. Yeah. It's hard to find yeah. the right therapist. <laughs> um, it's sort of be like if someone's going on Tinder and they're like, okay, I'm looking for, uh, you know, a six foot three, you know, blonde into Gilmore Girls, you know, like the, <laughs> someone's just rattling off all uh -huh. these things. And you're just like, oh, honey, mm -hmm. like just wait until you yeah. actually even find someone like that and right. find out that you hate that person. <laughs> like you should probably loosen up the, yeah. the the checking of the boxes a little bit and actually just try to find someone that you can tolerate. You know what uh, I mean? Some, I think uh, it's happened to me recently. Somebody said, you know, they were looking for a couple counselor and I was great because I was nearby and I'm just like, oh, man. Oh, I mean, I'm glad I'm nearby and that's convenient for you, but oh, wow, that's not a criteria I would ever use. Yeah. So Anonymous Patron goes on to say, what do you say to your male supervisees in this female-dominated field? About, um, about what? Uh, well, I think in relation to how they can, um, I don't know, be good for female clients or something i'm not sure oh. but yeah i mean it's a relevant question for sure uh, with everyone uh, you know we discuss gender socialization yeah. and and trauma really we've all been traumatized uh, by gender bias and socialization pre uh, oppression this kind of thing it's probably worth paying attention to privilege yeah uh, i actually i don't like what i just said can i say it again yeah it is absolutely worthwhile paying attention to privilege that <laughs> is a serious blind spot especially if you're a person of privilege, yeah. you can't smell your own bad breath. So you've got to pay attention. <laughs> I like that. Um, Cause you're used to it, I guess. Yeah, yeah exactly. And no one's ever pointed it out. That's exactly. Bad. Yeah. Uh, men in my circle have one been uh, self-selected for their wokeness, shall we say? Yeah. And also in terms of, the people who go to Antioch. Like you don't go to Antioch. Antioch in Seattle is known as the most socially progressive, yeah. even though the other institutions would like to think that they um, also have their reputation and they do. Yeah. But Antioch has a long history. I mean, we had right. credit Scott King as an alumni for crying out loud. Wow. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, Martin Luther King uh, was at our graduation at one of our campuses giving a speech, you know. Wow. Um, talking about the, the long history of how socially progressive Antioch has been since the mid 1800s. Wow. We had like some of the very first female paid professors, maybe the first in the United States. No kidding. Some of the first people of color as professors. Yeah, Antioch wow. has this long history of of this sort of thing. Um, a lot of the other institutions have, uh, I think, wisely, and, and I celebrate that they've woken up to that yeah. idea. You right. know, pretty much every college campus is on the social progressive side of things, yeah. you know. Um, but that wasn't always the case right. and anyway so uh so yeah i uh will ha a lot of the men that i teach and supervise i don't have to teach them about privilege because they've they've already either been woken up to that or they've taken a number of classes and experienced enough and so it's something that um that they definitely look at and i will point out um but anyway, yeah, I mean, it, gender socialization is a thing for, for everyone. Yeah. Um, and also how it affects their counter-transference and their bias is right. something always something to think about. Um, you go on to say here, what are your thoughts on therapists diagnosing their clients with borderline personality disorder as a way to discredit them? Oh, well, before going on to another topic, oh. um, I just want to say that to you, anonymous patron, it, you say that, you know, due to your experiences with men and women growing up, you have a preference for female therapists, and you can't really imagine yourself being with a male therapist. But I don't feel safe. Yeah, that's totally fine. You, you should not, just because Bob and I are saying it probably isn't a problem if you did have a male therapist, yeah. that doesn't mean that you should force yourself to no. have a male therapist. No. Um, you're... There's a lot more female therapists out there. Sure. <laughs> so you're you're 
you're in the majority in that one. Um, and you know, if if that identity helps in any way, by all means, you should yeah. advocate for that. I will, I'll also say that in the beginning of my career, when I was in an agency, uh, uh, people would come to the agency, right? They wouldn't come to me. Yeah, right. And they do an intake and they'd say, okay, well, what kind of therapist do you want? And sometimes people would say, oh, I want a male or I want a female. Right. And I will say in the beginning of, my, beginning of my career, it was kind of a pain in the ass when people would say they wanted a female, but then they're like, well, we don't have any females, females with openings. Right. You're going to get Kirk. And so I would get the intake and I'd see that as, yeah, well, they prefer a female, but they're getting you. Right. And, and it was, it was, it was hard in that yeah. respect because it's like I'm already walking into the room at a, at a deficit. Yeah. I will say that universally, I always won them over. You sure. know what I mean? Because again, it has more to do with your vibe than it has to do with gender. Yeah. What's the experience of Kirk in the room is right. really what it's going to boil down to. Yeah. And it, you know, I, socially, I, I it makes sense because, you know, there would be like a, a pretty 16-year-old girl who suffers from something and the parents are coming in and they're just like, well, they're not used to leaving their 16 year old girl in a room alone with a man. Yeah. So I get the, the impulse, Yeah. but we're different. Do you know what I mean? We're supposed to be anyway. (laughs) I'm different. I, 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 I I can be trusted. Now they don't know that because they don't know me or in that kind of thing. But, um, but yeah, I mean, there were lots of situations where in the beginning of my career, especially, you know, I talk about this sometimes where, and I'm, I'm sort of like a little weirded out by it, but definitely was not at the time, was I used to do in-home therapy uh, for years. Yeah. And half of my team, and it was a lot of teenagers, teenagers and parents that I was working with, and half the teenagers were female. And so... Um, and I'm the sort of family therapist that likes to meet alone with everyone in the family mm-hmm. at some point, you know, parents alone, kids sure. alone. Right. And it was in home, it was sort of inconvenient if I was to monopolize the living room for right. two hours. And so I would just, you know, I would ask and they, well, just go meet with her in the bedroom. And so I would, I would go into the teenage girl's bedroom and, right. and there's, there w- often wasn't a seat. And so I'd sit on the bed or I'd yeah. sit on the floor or something. Right and do therapy there yeah um and so uh if you took a snapshot of it it probably would have looked odd to society but to me it felt totally natural oh, yeah there was there was there was nothing odd about it and there wasn't a single creeper thought in my brain yeah because i'm a professional and i have my needs are met uh, you know, satisfactorily in the, in the normal ways. So let's just put it that way. You don't have a problem with aggression. Yeah. Yeah. And for whatever reason, I just, I just don't have a lot of creep genes in my DNA or something. I don't know, but, yeah. um, so, uh, the, uh, but I would benefit though, because uh, some people would have boys and they, you know, boys who miss their fathers, for example, and when given a choice, the parents would be like, well, it'd kind of be nice if he had a father figure. Uh, do you have a male therapist? So so overall, sure. I mostly benefited because of the preferences, uh, the way it would, did in the wash, since there were so few male therapists, right. I got all the male preferenced intakes. Do you right. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and there were plenty of female therapists for the female preference intakes. Right. Um, in fact, I would say the beginning of my career was probably twice as lucrative because I was one of the very few male therapists. Really? Yeah. Oh, because you get paid per case. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. I mean, in private practice, you know, you yeah, know like yeah. with the state stuff. And so right. um, anyway... You know, I think if we're seeking a therapist, we get to pick our level of challenge. So if gender is going to be something that distracts me and that's not relevant to or germane to my reason for coming to counseling, then yeah, right. You know, choose the one that makes me feel better. It's a dialectic, really, because you think about it on the one hand. Yeah, it actually makes sense. Choose the level of challenge. Choose the gender that makes you feel better, you know. And on the other hand... Um, there is the elimination of the possibility of an experience that one can't anticipate because one hasn't actually swam in the pool yet. 
So I'm thinking about a sweetie I had 100 years ago back in college who um, uh, had been abused by a man in her church when she was uh, young, uh, before, during high school years. And um, when she was in graduate training, she wanted to go to therapy and she was assigned a male therapist and that experience ended up turning out to be really invaluable to her because she was treated well by a man and had this kind of it had a corrective um it had a corrective uh, impact on her so and uh she told me about that guy he seemed like just a really decent warm gentle loving man yeah it's a great point i'm yeah. glad you brought that up because yeah. i, I would have forgot to bring that up yeah that's a a big point to bring up for people and i know a lot of you listeners have thought about that because you you will you'll email me about it for you anonymous patron of course you are free to make your own choices and should and but at the same time contemplate that your uh, discomfort with males could be um, corrected for emotionally um that's a weird word, but could be healed if you had, if you chose a warm, empathic male therapist, um, some of the wounds that you've experienced from men in your past uh, could be healed in that way. Whether or not that's a thing you care about or not is totally up to you. Yeah. Um, so you go on to say here, what are your thoughts on therapists diagnosing their clients with borderline personality disorder as a way to discredit them, especially when they make claims against the therapist, when the client makes claims against the therapist? Oh. And, um, in other words, you yeah. know, a client sues a therapist. The therapist says, well, that's just a symptom of borderline. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, it's gross. It shouldn't be done. Diagnoses are for assessment purpose alone. They're not to um, whack somebody on the head. And there is an unfortunate, and I hope it's shifting. I I don't know if it's shifting because I live in a sort of a bubble where um, the prejudice against that particular disorder is um, not such a big deal. But I do know that the world at large has a certain amount of ignorance and that the mental health community can treat folks with BPD or folks that they label with BPD with disdain and it's sort of like it's sort of like treating the person who's coming to you for a pen for, for surgery because you're a surgeon you say well i don't like treating people with that kind of problem you know it's like well you you're a surgeon right you treat what comes in the door right so i don't really love my metaphor but nonetheless well it'd be as though like if this if um there were certain kinds of cancers that they were like well pe- those those kinds of cancers are self-inflicted right um, that that's just because they had a they had a weak they have lung cancer because they probably smoke cigarettes or right. you know it's this discounting of the human being yeah. that is um, based on you know clinical labels or something yeah using the labels though for unintended purposes I, shit when I was in uh, when I was when I first moved here um, I was working at this mental health clinic down Renton and. I got referred a client who had borderline personality disorder, and unfortunately, I was swimming in a pool of um, prejudice against that particular disorder, like all around me. And the way people talked about this client, it actually scared me. And so when I started knowing her, um, I was afraid of her. And two things happened. One is I discovered nobody got that one right. She didn't have borderline personality disorder. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know for what that's worth. That people people mis, misuse and misdiagnose. And the other was she was lovely, really lovely, lovely person. I liked her quite a bit. What behavior were they looking at that cued them to think it was borderline? She was in crisis and she was angry and she was scared. And so she would be demanding. And quite frankly, she had a psychotic illness. And I think that when she was having psychotic symptoms, part of the way it came out is in this sort of brittle, angry, demanding behavior. Yeah. But by and large with me, she was just sweet. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder too, if it is the circle that we're in, the bubble that we're in, Mm -hmm. uh, because I will occasionally bump up against other circles and realize, oh, maybe... (sighs) Maybe this hasn't changed at all. It's discouraging, man. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, just a, <clears throat> another example of just how 
I don't know how to put this, <laughs> how bad our training is, I guess. <laughs> um, you know, the fact that people will not have been told other things. You know, like one of the things that I'm frequently ranting about is the frequent misconception of psychodynamic theory. Yeah, right. And that, you know, I, I gave a lecture on psychodynamic therapy uh, recently in, in class. And, and as a way of saying to everyone, look, um, okay, you don't, have to, you don't have to believe in psychodynamic therapy. You don't have to follow it. But you do have to respect what it gave us. My cat suddenly has a chiming in. Tremendous respect from the yeah. cat. Um, <laughs> Sorry, cat. <laughs> well, you, when you scare her... Uh, which well, she's easily scared. She, uh, she okay. We don't want to say hi. <laughs> it's not a happy looking cat right now. No, she's happy. She she's just she's she just, she's just talking. You know, she's the smallest creature in our house. Makes the most noise. Oh. Um, the dog barely barks. The rest of us are fairly quiet. But uh, what was I oh, saying? Oh, you're giving a lecture about psychodynamic oh. theory and what it's given us. Yeah, thank you. For, sure. <laughs> um, and long story short, I laid out a number of different things, and a lot of the students were like, wait, so the other theories don't hold those? You know, the idea of personality is actually totally a psychodynamic idea, and the other fields generally don't have the idea of personality and they reject it. Yeah. Cognitive theory, behavioral theory, humanistic therapy in general, especially at its roots, completely rejected the notion of personality and embrace the notions that you can, uh, you are who you say you are and you can change that at any time, essentially. Yeah. Um, and so the idea of the unconscious the idea of attachment, yeah. it basically came out of psychodynamic theory. And so, anyway, um, so I wonder sometimes about how weirdly bad our training is. Um, it's one thing to uh, be taught that psychodynamic theory, although should be respected or has, these, has this history, maybe not be, maybe in that professor's opinion, isn't the best idea. It's another thing to graduate from graduate school with complete just misconceptions about theory and about borderline, yeah. which many people do. Oh, yeah. And so, um, uh, yeah, I, I would bump up against this sometimes where um, people will talk that way that this was, what, 30 years ago that you were at, in Renton yeah. at that agency? I, those mm. conversations are still happening today. Mm. I, about five years ago, I was at an agency in a staff meeting and I wasn't in power. And so I couldn't, I didn't feel like I could really do much about it, but the same sentiment was going on. Um, and in other professions as well, like I had, I worked with a client once uh, in collaboration with a physician. So we were both trying to help this client and the physician was getting kind of scared of the situation oh. and said, um, you know, I think I think she has borderline personality disorder, oh, man. and I was like, "What? Like, <laughs> um, where does that come from?" One, two, uh, you clearly don't understand what borderline personality is. Yeah. Uh, it's just a it's a it's a tag word. Yeah. I think for a lot of people of yeah. like, this person's difficult. Right, they're giving me shit, uh -huh. or they're resistant to therapy uh -huh. or just something, just some kind of frustration. Right. And thus they have borderline and thus I don't have to do anything. Oh yeah. Right. That second part uh, is really important. Right. I don't have to do anything is I wash my hands of it, you know? Right. It's, it's a lost cause or That's, something. And it's like, what, you know, yeah. uh, one, okay, fine. If you think the person is borderline. Okay. Well, it, if that's what you think, let's talk about that. Sure. But, Okay, now what? Yeah, treat it. Yeah, treat if, it. If there, you think that's a, what's wrong. Yeah, there's a way to treat all the things in the DSM. Yeah. You know, there's an approach that works that is empirically sound. Um, and so, yeah, it makes me sick. And, and the, the, part, the part that really just kind of gets me is um, 
why in the fuck did you become a counselor if this is how you want to think about people? Yeah. Like, why did you even enter the field? Yeah. I get if some Joe Schmo on the corner wants to write people off because of they're mentally ill or they're borderline or something, you know, that's fine. You're, you're a lay person. You're not, a, you didn't, you didn't invite that sort of concept into your life. Right. By entering this field, you are inviting yeah. this into your life. Right. And to conclude that there's a, there's a section of humans that are like lost causes and should be rejected and should be terminated early right. and should be discounted is, is like, uh, get out of the field. Like you're not in the right field. Yeah. Like there are plenty of other jobs on the planet for you to, you know, you could have been. Uh, feel free to quit being a counselor and do those other things. There are, uh, you know, a You'll lot. be happier. Yeah. Uh, the world will be better with you doing that. Become a car salesman. <laughs> you know what I mean? Do something else. Uh, stay out of this field, you know? It'd be like me entering, like you said, uh, the field of surgery or something and just being like, oh, yeah, people with cancer, gross. I yeah. don't want to work with them. It's yeah. just like, well... No one forced you into this field. Yeah, right. <laughs> Guess what? Guess what came in the door? That's what you work with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, it, it, yeah, I just we have strong feelings about the anonymous patrons question here. What do we think about that? We think it's a bad idea. It shouldn't be done. Right. So, I'm guessing anonymous patron, you've experienced that either firsthand or secondhand or something. I'm sorry. Where um, therapists diagnosing their clients with borderline as a way to to discredit them. And, and especially when they make claims against the therapist. Um, let's address that more specifically. Thoughts about that? Well, it's like not, if there's a complaint or a lawsuit or something. Well, it's not relevant. And any, any um, administrative body that deals with those kind of complaints, uh, if they're not outraged, they should be. Because it's not useful. It's not descriptive. It has no information in it. And it's um, purely to undermine somebody else. And it's playing on the potential for prejudice against. Right. So, you know, like w maybe if you really want to talk about how you think the person's personality is a factor in their complaint, you should just describe it in just plain language. You don't need a diagnosis to say something about that if that's what you believe is the case. Yeah, it's a, it'd be similar to if a African-American was to... Uh, say that um, they didn't do it or something, yeah. the, the crime, right. if they were, you know, uh, accused of a crime and be like, well, you know, they're African-American. So like uh, most of us would understand that's ridiculous. Yeah. That, that doesn't say anything. No. And it speaks more to the person saying it than it then, does. To, <laughs> right. It's informational, but not about the person yeah. that's being talked about. <laughs> now, I will say that these, uh, you know, licensing boards and judges are not necessarily uh, different <laughs> than no. than uh, therapists, and will uh, often this will be a valid defense, mm -hmm. or you mean a, a recognized one? Or yeah, a sorry, one that's a, a recognized as valid defense, a, an a yeah. erroneously yeah. <laughs> recognized as valid defense. Right, right. They'll see it as valid, and so you know, uh, it might work at the same time as it's gross. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's it's. It's awful. Now, uh, what I also will say is that uh, considering a person's state of mind and their issues is relevant. I'm not going to say that it's not. No. But being borderline, simply the label, yeah, it's not doesn't empirically say anything. Nothing. Uh, one can uh, perhaps be a slightly more likely to be triggered into uh, being upset if you have the traumas that have led to what we label as borderline. Yeah. But one can have traumas that lead to lots of labels in the DSM mm -hmm. that um, can be triggered by a therapist and create, shall we say, distortions of evaluation of the service that's provided. If that's even the case. Right. Imagine you're being accused of something and you did it. You're, you know... You're going to throw, you, I guess you could, you could throw that term borderline at the client saying, oh, we'll see because they're borderline, right. you know, we, we don't have to validate there. In fact, I think that happened to somebody that I was, uh, that was in my, one of my DBT students. I think that actually happened to her when she was abused by one of her treaters and um, 
I'm pretty sure that the whatever the system was that she was in that was adjudicating, um, they took the doc's side, and um, uh, as a result, she lost her case. And I think that part of the defense was her mental health troubles. Like they actually used her symptoms and her difficulties as evidence that she was not credible. Yeah, and so on one level, that's prejudicial and awful yeah. and oppressive. On another hand, it if and I could see in some cases where it would be relevant. You know, someone is let's take a non-borderline example. Someone has a history of psychosis. All right, and their psychosis has to do with paranoia and um, believing that they, uh, you know people are out to get them yeah. and they're um, the client might have thought at some point that a previous physician had broken into his house right um, when in fact that wasn't likely yeah even though you couldn't prove it. it's like well he covered his tracks right. you know but everyone's like well you were in a psychotic episode yeah. for those two months the likelihood right that your doctor actually broke into your house yeah. is has to be you know it, and it's because it's a he said, he said situation. Sure, the right. doctor said, no, I never broke into his house. Right. The, the patient's like, yes, he did. Yeah, right. Well, it is relevant to bring up the psychotic Absolutely. symptoms. Yeah. So so in borderline or any other personality disorder, for that matter, any any disorder, um, you know, is is relevant when you're trying to figure out the um, the veracity or the intensity, shall we yeah. say, of, of, of the claim. Um, but to simply... Uh, just say that someone's borderline and, and that somehow is yeah. open and open and shut case. Um, in the case of this client, if you're going to stick with the psychotic thing, the doctor actually broke into their house. What? No, no, I'm, I'm, oh. I'm, I'm using this as a metaphor. <laughs> I was <laughs> like, right. wow, I just the, took a swing. Okay. Yeah. No, no, no. So, so my, my client, she actually was abused. Yeah. Right. She actually was abused. Um, so I think the court, or whoever it was, I, I don't know if it was a court, they sided with the doc because of her history of mental health troubles, even though she actually was abused by this provider. Even though the fact of the uh, sexual contact between the two people was not in dispute. Yeah, I didn't say it was sexual contact, but... Well, um, whatever sort you know, of whatever abuse was, yeah. that happened, yeah. that the contact or the abuse mm -hmm. was not de debated. No. The, the clinician admitted, yes, those things did happen. This happened because my client, blah, blah, blah. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 So that's. Uh, Greasy. Yeah. And, and not surprising. Uh, one of the surprises that I have discovered uh, in my, you know, being uh, pay, uh, contracted as an expert in some of these situations. It, really? Yeah, and, and also oh, and also um, uh, reading a lot of ethical yeah. cases where right. true cases where right. it actually goes to the state or right. the court or something. The thing that I have walked away with is that in general the system supports the clinicians. Like when in doubt, mm -hmm. which a lot of them are like that. Mm -hmm. and a lot of them are sort of like, well, you know, it's yeah. kind of in a gray area. They tend to support the clinician, right? Which it has has good news and bad news. On good news, we I can tell my trainees, look, all your paranoia about ethics and and the law and everything is overblown. You you need to do what's right. If mm -hmm. I mean, if, of anyone you know who will keep supervisees, you know, um, ethical and will sort of rail about that, it's me. But at the same time the amount of fear that therapists have is just way yeah. overblown, particularly yeah. in the beginning. Right. And so uh, be, not only because there's a lot more flexibility than I think they realize, but also because the chance of you actually, even when you do ma make a mistake, the chance of you actually being complained about is really, really mm -hmm. low. Yeah. And then even if it goes to the top of the chain, the chance of you being found quote unquote guilty or whatever the you know yeah. sort of uh, situation at hand is, um, is actually pretty low as well. And even if you are found quote unquote guilty, the consequences are often pretty low. Yeah. I mean, just as an example, um, 
that we had a uh, you know a listener to the podcast Mayate. She um, wants her name out there as someone who went through this, and we did a couple few podcasts about her situation years ago, but. She had a therapist who, uh, the long and short of it was that he um, used a lot of touch in therapy, starting mm-hmm. with touching the hand, then leading to um, eventually where they're basically on the couch cuddling for the whole hour, and he's caressing her. Um, they're in a full embrace, body to body, and he's saying how much he wants to have sex with her and, and, and how beautiful she is. Uh. And, and, um, you know, basically, like, Maite was like, well, the next time we get together, we're probably going to have sex. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, and this therapist had, you know, it's pretty obvious. It's, it's a problem, right? Yeah. Well, the th- well, she complained and uh, bravely stood up and said, this is not okay. And this therapist needs to be looked at. And... Because I was a part of the of the case, um, I learned the the consequence, which with the, to the licensing board was a. Uh, I think he went on probation for a period of time, mm-hmm. and he needed to get a certain amount of supervision and education, and then he could get his license back, and then he could which or maybe he need, never even lost his license, but he had to do supervision, take some classes, um, you know, never do that again, that kind of thing. And he was practicing again. Yeah. And 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 so I figured the sort I can't remember, but I think he had to pay a fine too or something. But I think the 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 time and money penalty was pretty low. Yeah. Um. And so all the other things that my supervisees worry about are like far below that kind of egregious behavior, right. you know? I accepted a gift. Am I going to go to jail for the rest of my life? You know, that kind of <laughs> thought. And so um, so anyway, uh, but yeah, so you ask Adama's patron, um, you know, is, is it a way to discredit them? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, it does get used that way. Yuck. And it does work that way. Yeah. And it's because our field doesn't understand borderline and our society sure as shit doesn't understand mental illness in general. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so uh, an oppressed class continues to get oppressed. Um, And I will also say that the oppressed class is everyone. Everyone's on a personality disorder spectrum of some sort, if not several. So uh, we're talking about everyone here. Yeah. <laughs> this is, there's not like, oh, the mentally ill and, you know, people who qualify for a DSM diagnosis and those who don't. I mean, if you don't qualify for one, you're a hair away from one. <laughs> uh, so, so uh, you know, it, it's, we just need to recognize we're really just talking about humans and their defenses against difficulty. Yeah. It's, it's, that's, that's all. That's a lot of these things that DSM are. And so uh, anyway. So let's take a break, but when we get back, it's going to be for patrons only. What do you say, Bob? Sounds good. So become a patron of the podcast. You can listen to the rest of this meandering episode in which we respond to patron emails. <laughs> 